I am Tongva descent from these lands which you stand on now. I was asked to come here and honor you with our presence to remind you that we're here and to and to welcome you in and allow you to see what it is, how we treat Mother Earth, you know, how we treat each other with love and respect. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start this prayer off. Can the mic work? Oh, there's this one right Can you guys hear me? Yeah. So I'm gonna start in the direction of the north. This is infancy. This is where life starts off. I ask the spirits of the north to guide us, guide us in our new beginnings. Keep us protected, our children, our babies, protected. I go on into the east. This is where youth comes about. This is where the new growth is seen. And this is where we start our journey. And sometimes we experience some really horrible things, but this is part of our growth. So I ask the spirits of the east to guide us all as we endure these pains and these journeys. Keep us safe and protected. We will go through things that are painful, but they are things that help our growth. I turn to the south and I ask the spirits of the south to guide us and protect, protect us. This is about the time that we're in our adulthood. Now we need healing. So I ask the spirits of this direction to guide us and heal us and help us to understand why we just went through everything in the east, in our youth. Give us the strength to push through and continue on. Give us the strength to understand our journey and to find the healing within. I move to the West and I ask the spirits of the West to bring us home. If we haven't found our healing yet, this in the West is where we will find our healing in the spirit realm. I ask the spirits of this direction to guide us in as we make our journey home. I offer prayers to Creator, our grandfather who has guided us and who has protected us. Sometimes we forget our way and that's okay. When that happens, stop listening to the outside world. Sit in silence and listen within and that is when you'll be reminded of why you are here and what you need to be doing. I offer prayers to Mother Earth. Like some of us, she has been raped. But the difference, what Mother Earth shows us is what we don't always see in ourselves is when these things happen. No matter how much we hurt her, how much we try to kill her, how much we rape her, how much we take and take and forget to give back, or mindlessly don't care. She shows us through the sidewalks, the little cracks, and she, she has these beautiful flowers growing out and plants continuing to show growth. The tops of the mountains that still have trees. You know, look around and you'll see her beauty shine through all the crap that we continue to give her. And I ask her for that strength, for everybody here who has gone through something. I ask that you look around touch Mother Earth and ask her for that strength and seek within a oh. home. Thank you. I just want to give everybody a reminder that just like a wound when cut with a knife, you'll bleed. But soon that will heal and you'll be left with a scar. Well, that scar is a memory. You'll look at that scar and you'll remember what you went through. But that's okay. You might feel that pain when you look at that scar and be like, oh, I remember how much that hurt. And everything that we go through, it's the same thing. We have scars, but that means that we're healing. So we have to accept the healing. Everybody, each and every one of you, myself included, has gone through some horrible, painful things. You know, whether it's we lost a brother, a mother, a father, or just experience something that maybe we felt shouldn't have been done, but we have to remember that we have come here on this planet as a human being. 
Our spirit form has decided to come here and experience. We chose to experience things because that's what makes our spirit stronger. All the inflicted pain, it helps us to be stronger, okay? So keep that in mind and move forward and allow yourself to be healed. Ho. Oh. Our community needs healing now. It's time to leave the anger behind and allow ourselves to heal. In fact, I have a song called Dolores about a young woman who was raped. You might want to listen to it. It helps us to heal. That's what we need. And I pray for your healing, ma'am. I hope. to Survivors March. Who's excited for this? Woo! Let's hear it. Let's hear that again. Let's Hollywood make them listen to us. That's right. And before we get started, I would just like to ask everyone if you can hold someone's hand right now. Whoever is next to you, hold their hand. Because this movement is not about us individually. It's us as a movement. And that's why we're here today. And that's why all of us say, Me Too. I got it. Hashtag Me Too was created by activist Tarana Burke a decade ago. Since the hashtag Me Too went viral two weeks ago, in the wake of sexual harassment allegations against producer Harvey Weinstein, Twitter reports more than 1.7 million women and men have used the hashtag in 85 countries. That's a lot of people. We have a problem. This is the power of hashtag Me Too, the power of us. Today, we gather to bring light to our experience as living, as living as women in this day and age. Today, we are strong. Today, we are brave. Today, we are the face of the movement, each and every one of us. If you were scared before, if you are scared today, if you are scared tomorrow, you are part of this movement. movement. Whatever experience you went through, it happened. There's no way to change it. But the way that we change is by not being victims, but by being victors. So everyone, raise your hand and say, me too. 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 We are here today because we have an amazing leader in our community. She saw the hashtag going viral. And she said, we have to do something about it. Brenda Gutierrez. She's the lead organizer. She first saw her Facebook newsfeed fill up with the hashtag MeToo status. And in reaction to this, she felt heartbroken and angered to see that many of us have been dealing with this alone in silence. As an activist and grassroots community organizer with California for Progress, she is used to marching and rallying for a variety of social issues. As MeToo caught fire, she and other survivors started asking, why don't we do a march for this? Why is this subject kept in the shadows? And why do we only hear about sexual assault when it involves someone famous? All of us here today are important, no matter if we're famous, if we're rich, if we're privileged, if we're unprivileged, no matter our story, we're important. Here is Brenda Gutierrez, the leader and the person that brought all of us together today. Please give her a hand. I know I'm getting way too much credit, but I definitely have to give credit to give credit to Tarana Burke because she was the one that inspired me to begin with. Um, yeah. It's a little bit, if you would have told my 15 year old self that I would be here talking about this issue, I wouldn't have believed it. Um, I guess as, a, as survivors, we're used to saying, 
this did, keeping it to ourselves, not knowing who to turn to. One of the biggest things that I, that I thought about when when I des decided to like, hey, let's get this march together, it's like let's show people, let's show people that we're not alone. I grew up with the idea that we had to stay quiet about this, that this that this was something to be ashamed of, and the more fixing the mic. You get closer to the mic, they'll turn it down, and okay. you'll be able to speak without feedback. Okay. That good? Kiss it. Ow. Good? Okay. Woo! Yeah! Woo! So, one of the biggest messages that I want to make sure that we all go with this today is that we will no longer be silenced and we will no longer be ashamed. We are survivors, we are warriors, and we will not stop until there's a change. Right. I want my nieces and my nephews to grow up and to be able to say, what, what is that? Why is this like even an issue? And it, it bothers me that we do only pay attention when it's someone famous. We're forgetting that this happens in our communities every day. It happens in our military. It happens to our indigenous women. You know, I keep thinking, this, this is more than just about me. This is more just than just each individual here. This is for all of us. I'm sorry, I didn't even prepare a speech because I was so like <laughs> busy. And it makes me want to cry just seeing everyone here because growing up, I thought I was alone. And I'm looking at the audience and I realize I'm not alone and neither are you because we're here for you. And like I said, you know, we will no longer be ashamed. We will no longer be silenced. And we're here and we're proud. We're survivors and we're warriors and we will get through this together and we will make a change. Thank you. for bringing us together and all the activists that work on this march. Now, we have a very special person coming up because this activist has been working for over a decade. And just now, we're coming to learn about her and her movement. But this has been going on for 10 years and even longer than that. Tarana Burke. Anybody know that name? The allegations against Harvey Weinstein became public knowledge, and we got to n learn about Tarana Burke, who was already helping young women talk about sexual assault. Working with girls at an organization she co-founded called Just Be Inc., she heard a lot of reports of sexual assault, and she wanted to offer young survivors what she needed in the, in, in the aftermath of her own assault, empathy. So she started the hashtag MeToo campaign, to spread a message for survivors. You were heard, you were understood, and we are here today saying, Me too! Here is Tarana Burke. Wow. <laughs> All right, this is a great crowd. Can everybody hear me? So I have my remarks written down here so I don't get lost. Um, today marks the fourth Sunday since the start of the phenomenon that is the hashtag MeToo. Nothing in the last decade of using MeToo in my work against sexual violence could have prepared me for what has happened in the last month. And although one of the most sensational results of this viral moment has been watching the mighty fall like autumn leaves, that's a New York reference. Don't really have that, but um, although that's been one of the most sensational things about this, that is not what I'm here to talk about today. I don't want to spend a moment of my time calling the names of folks who don't deserve to share breath with me. Uh, because this day is not for them. This day is for us. So today I want to call names like Alicia Barrows, founder of Tell Somebody Inc who was working to end the culture of silence around ch child sexual abuse. And Bre Brenda Gutierrez, who had the vision for today's march. I wanna, I wanna call the names of survivor leaders across the country 
who are on the ground doing work every day, like LA's own Amita Swadin. I want to spend time honoring survivors like all of you here today in spite of. See, there's a lot of attention on us right now and a lot of talk about how the power of Me Too will bring down Hollywood. Yes. But, but let me take you back for a moment to a time before hashtags. Just like the courage and strength it took you all to gather here in spite of your present fears and invisible scars, Me Too was always about helping survivors figure out what life could look like in spite of. It was a permissive whisper an exchange of empathy between knowing souls that help to forge a pathway away from the shame so many of us carry and struggle with daily. I have witnessed these simple words help propel people onto their healing journey for years. But I could never imagine having a global community of what is now well over millions of people across 85 countries. At this point, no one using social media can say that they haven't seen it. Me Too is everywhere. But I don't want us to get lost in the numbers. We have all of the empirical data that we need to know that this issue will not be ignored. But I would be lying if I said I didn't have concerns about this viral moment. Yes, the numbers are amazing. But what is more important is that the world understand that every single time you see the hashtag Me Too, it represents a story that was created in tragedy but found its way to triumph. Every hashtag is an act of bravery, or a bold declaration, or a breakthrough even. But behind every hashtag is also a person. And while our collective voices make up a beautiful chorus, we cannot lose sight of the underlying factor, the common denominator that brought us here. It's easy to be swept up in the hype and the numbers, but what we represent here today, what we represent by gathering and marching in the streets this afternoon is a reminder a living, breathing reminder that we are human beings, not hashtags. The sexual violence that we endured, whatever it was, was an attempt to undermine our humanity. But as we all stand here in beautiful unison, we are a glorious rejection of that. With our whole bodies and with our whole hearts, we come today out of the shadows and away from the dark, hollow narrative that we are somehow complicit in our own abuse. We come to stand in the face of fear and ridicule and rejection and shame and say, you tried to take me out because you thought I was alone, but not today. For every one of you who has a story, no matter where you fall on the spectrum of sexual violence, please know that your voice, your presence, your dignity, your humanity matters. You are not the sum of your experiences. You are a gift to the world. And today we stand together to make sure the world knows this. I'm about to close, but I wanna clarify some things first. I've heard more times in a little bit that this is the start of the movement. But many of you, like me, have been at this for years. So I'm clear that the Me Too movement is a spoke in the wheel of a larger movement to end gender-based violence. I've been a part of that movement for the better part of a decade. But you and I know that before four Sundays ago, you would have never known my name. Which brings me to my next point. The origins of Me Too are rooted deep in the most marginalized communities. In school cafeterias and church basements that provided safe spaces for black and brown girls forgotten and dismissed by those who had resources to help them. So it pains me that black and brown women and girls in communities where Me Too was born now feel disconnected from this moment. We can march and we can make our own voices heard, but if we are not centering and elevating the voices often drowned out, meaning black folks and brown folks and native folks and Asian folks and queer folks and trans folks and disabled folks, then our work will ring hollow. This moment we are in did not happen in a vacuum. It was built on the backs of these same folks. You can't get to Gretchen Carlson without Anita Hill. You can't get to Alyssa Milano, who I pay homage to, by the way, but you can't get to her without Tarana Burke. And while I'm grateful for her amplification of this movement, I want to be clear that women of color have been on the front lines for years. Okay. So the big question is, what happens next? 
first, let me stop and ask everyone here to take out your phone yes. and text the words "me too" to 90975. I don't want to forget that. That is the way that we are keeping in touch with folks, so people can un can know what's happening as things go on in the work that we're doing. I want everybody to be involved, and plus, my people would kill me if I didn't say that. <laughs> It, it's 90975. Text the words ME TOO. It's true that the viral moment will pass, but the work is just beginning. The ME TOO movement is focused on two things. Providing resources for survivors, particularly those with traditionally, traditionally less access, and helping folks take action on the ground in their communities to interrupt sexual violence. We are the embodiment of the personal is political. Yes. We want and demand radical change as long, and as long as we harness the power of this moment, we will not lose because losing is not an option. Yes. We have kicked in the door and now it's time to tear down the house brick by brick. Yes. That's right. yeah. I don't know about you, but I'm ready. And if you're ready, if you are ready, let me hear you say, me too. Me too. Me too. Me too. Me too. Thank you. Hey, guys. Okay, we're back. <laughs> wow. Just wow. The next speaker is somebody you might recognize on the big screen. I'm a big fan myself. Frances Fisher is an actress and activist. She is extremely grateful to her fellow actresses who brought sexual assault to the attention of the mainstream media through the New York Times and the New Yorker. She is here now to stand with survivors from all walks of life. She is the executive board member of the Environmental Media Association and is serving as a national board member for SAG-AFTRA. She is working with an amazing group of women to create a National Women's History Museum in Washington, D.C. Because we deserve it, right? <laughs> Ms. Fisher was a surrogate for Bernie Sanders and spent time at Standing Rock supporting the water protectors. So help me welcome Frances Fisher. Hey everybody, little housekeeping note, remember to pick up your trash and your signs when we leave. Yeah. I'm a mother, <laughs> protect Mother Earth. I didn't know what to say because I know every lady up here speaking is going to say what's in my heart, so I called Eve Ensler. You know Eve Ensler, the vagina monologues and one billion rising, she's been working with women across the world about violence against women and stopping sexual assault and sexual harassment and everything else. So she sent me something. May I read it to you? Yeah. <clears throat> I am over rape. I'm over women, cisgender, transgender, and gender non-conforming, having to tell our stories over and over, traumatizing and re-traumatizing ourselves over and over, when the stories and the names and the identities of perpetrators remain protected and anonymous. I am over rape culture, where privileged men with political and physical and economic power take what and who they want, when they want it, as much as they want, any time they want it. This would include the super predator in chief, Donald Trump, who was elected by bragging about grabbing women's pussies without their consent and who had, has more than 15 charges of abuse against him. Harvey Weinstein, Bill Cosby, Roger Ailes, Bill O'Reilly, the list is endless. It's not enough to fire them and have them walk away with millions. Sexual abuse is already illegal. I am over how long it takes for anyone to respond to rape, how long corporations and partners protect abusers through payouts and backroom deals. If that same president or CEO stole money from you or killed someone, you can bet they'd be fired on the spot and he would be charged in court. I am over the three out of four women who experience sexual harassment feeling they can't tell anyone for fear of losing their job or of not being believed. 
I am over women being slowly made insane and angered and humiliated and shamed by being forced to ignore, deny, block out, tolerize, minimize the sexual harassment in order to survive. I am over 33 million U.S. women being sexually harassed and 14 million sexually abused in work-related incidents. I am over domestic workers being held as sex slaves. I am over room attendants in hotels having to fight to get panic buttons installed on their beings because they can hardly bend over to clean a bathtub without fear of being attacked by male guests. I am over restaurant workers being made to tolerate being grabbed, insulted, degraded, and harassed at jobs because they are reliant on tips and paid $2.30 an hour. I'm over 76% of nurses being verbally assaulted and kicked, punched, bitten, grabbed, or attacked by their patients or visitors on the job. I am over 60% of women farm workers suffering sexual abuse, so much so that their place of work has been named the Field del Calzon, the field of the panties. I am over the hundreds of thousands of women in Congo still waiting for the rapes to end and the rapists to be held accountable. I am over the thousands of women in Bosnia, Myanmar, Pakistan, South Africa, Guatemala, Sierra Leone, Haiti, Nigeria, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, Iraq, you name a place, still waiting for justice. I am over one in three women in the U.S. military getting raped by their so-called comrades. I am over the fact that half of all the transgender people and lesbians will experience sexual violence. I am over the fact that 75% of women in prison have historic or severe physical abuse by an intimate partner, and 82% suffered serious physical or sexual abuse as children, and they are further being punished rather than healed. I am over college campuses being places young women survive rather than places they thrive because of rape culture. I am over the forces that deny women who have been raped the right to have an abortion. I am over rape victims being re-raped when they go public. I am over women still being silent about rape because they are made to believe it's their fault, because they did something to make it happen like wearing the wrong clothes, because they are terrified they will get fired or won't get the part or ever work again. I am over people not understanding that rape is not a joke. And I'm over being told that we don't have a sense of humor and women don't have a sense of humor when the most of the women I know, and I know a lot, are really pretty fucking funny. We just don't like being forced to watch a vile, powerful man masturbate in front of us or keep or get a job or having an uninvited penis up our anuses or our vaginas. We don't think that's a laugh riot. I'm over be women being forced to leave their homes when their husbands beat them. I'm over violence against women not being a number one international priority when one out of three women will be raped or beaten in her lifetime. The destruction and muting and undermining of women is the destruction of life itself. No women, no future, guys. I am over the endless resurrection of the careers of rapists and sexual exploiters, film directors, world leaders, corporate executives, shamans, priests, rabbis, imams, gurus, coaches, doctors, movie stars, athletes, you put in the rest. While the lives of women are violated, they're devastated, often forcing them to live in social and emotional exile. I'm over listening to a predator who has slept with and then married his stepdaughter, expressing his empathy for a mutual predator. I am over years and years of being over rape and rewriting and updating this piece over it. I'm thinking about rape every day of my life since I was five years old. I'm over getting sick from rape. I'm over getting depressed from rape. I'm over getting enraged by rape. I'm over reading my insanely crowded inbox of rape horror stories every hour of every single day. I am over being polite about rape 
It's been too long now. We have been too understanding. We need it to end now. We need, we need people to truly try and imagine once and for all what it feels like to have your body invaded, your mind splintered, your soul shattered. And really, deeply, truly, I am over the passivity of good men. Where the hell are you? You live with us, work with us, make love with us, father us, befriend us, brother us, get us, that you nurtured, you're mothered, you're eternally supported by us. So why aren't you standing with us? Not the guys here, obviously. Why aren't you driven to the point of madness and action by the rape and harassment, degradation and humiliation of us? Why aren't you rising in droves, going beyond apologies and confessions, realizing this is your issue, not ours? Why don't you see? Why don't you see yet? If you were st to stand as one fierce band of insistent, consistent, loving men, speaking to your brothers, calling out your brothers, interrogating yourselves, dismantling patriarchy in every boardroom, audition hall, hotel, hospital, office, farm, reservation, school, locker rooms, this whole thing could change overnight. There are approximately one billion women on the planet who have already been violated. One billion women and girls. Can we rise together? Can we change the paradigm? Can we rebirth the culture? Because we know that when women are free and safe and equal and allowed to be alive in all their intensity, the whole story will finally change? Yes? yes? Yeah! Me too. Yeah. 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 I just want to briefly um, mention some of the stories that we can see on Twitter. Rafaela says, me too. He was my stepfather. Troy says, I was 15, he was 24. I said, stop, he kept going. May says, me too, he was 56 and I was 17. Those are some of the stories we can see online of brave people coming forward. Before we introduce the next speaker, I just wanna let everyone know that we have support groups. If any of this is triggering anything inside you, if you would like to just be heard by anyone without any judgment, please come to one of our tables and somebody will be able to help you start the healing process. Ivy Kicho is a rape survivor and the Affirm National Chairperson. A firm has been hosting the Purple Rose Day campaign for more than 18 years to stand up against the capitalist assault on women's bodies and speaking out against the trafficking and commodification of women and children's body. Please help me welcome Ivy Kicho. How are you all doing today? I can't hear you, how are you all doing today? Yeah. Whose streets? Whose streets? Whose streets? Whose streets? Whose streets? Whose streets? Thank you all for coming out today. Give yourselves a round of applause. They're cheering in solidarity. <laughs> My name is Ivy Kitcho and I am the national chairperson of Affirm, an all-volunteer, transnational feminist, anti-imperialist organization of women of color and of survivors. I am here in front of you 
quite literally, because my activist organizing has saved my life. I was a victim of child sexual abuse starting at the age of two. A victim of rape at the age of 15 by someone I knew, not necessarily a rich, powerful public predator. And a victim of intimate partner physical violence as an adult, not to mention all the other forms of structural violence that come with being a woman of color, specifically an Asian Pacific Islander, daughter of Filipino immigrant parents, and growing up in poor working class neighborhoods in a country that has intentionally stacked the odds against me. As a survivor, there have been many times that I wanted to give up. From the exhausting, daily demeaning thoughts that prevent you from doing simple tasks like getting out of bed, to the terrifying panic attacks from flashbacks, to the nightly jaw clenching and hip tightness because our body parts hold sadness, not just from today, but generations past. But sisters, I am here today to tell you that be because of my 13 years of organizing in a firm, a firm has provided me the one thing that pushes me forward, the one thing that gets me up every single day when I have suicidal thoughts, the one thing that pushes me to keep on track, and that is hope. We in a firm are here to tell all the women of color, black, brown, yellow, indigenous, trans women, each and every woman of color like me, that we see you. This is our commitment to you. We will do what our ancestors had done and taught us for centuries. We will get back up every time with even more seething rage. We will resist every twisted tactic they may throw at us, and we will fight with every last drop of strength we have left until genuine liberation is ours. The hashtag MeToo movement exposes on a mainstream level what has been happening to women, particularly women of color, for centuries. 4,500, 4,500 years ago, patriarchy was created when we women became the first form of property. Rape culture didn't just come out of nowhere. It was born out of we, what we in a firm call the perceived patriarchal entitlement to women's bodies. For centuries, access to women of color's bodies in particular has been expected. And this belief has been given life through colonization when our bodies and land were ravished. Through capitalism, when our bodies became commodified for prostitution. Through imperialism and war and military, when we were sold on a large scale for what has become the global sex trade. From the online mail order bride system, to institutionalized red light districts, to the attempts at legalizing prostitution. Sisters, while this has been happening to us for all this time, what Trump, what those sexists, what those misogynists, what those fascists who uphold patriarchy seem to forget, is that we are still here and we are not going anywhere. When someone asked me what I thought about the publicly finally listening, and not just listening, but with compassion and believing our stories, they asked me what my response was to this. And to be honest, my response was, it's about goddamn time. Now is the time that society stops normalizing harassment, assault, and rape as a private, everyday occurrence that used to be acceptable. This shit was never acceptable. And what we talk about, when we talk about sexual assault and rape, we have to talk about it as a way to dehumanize in order to amass power and control. This is not about sex addiction. This is about amassing power and control over women and our communities that we oversee. Now is the time that we see how these recent acts of terror are all connected. It is no coincidence that from Charlottesville to Las Vegas to Texas, the common denominator is and has been domestic violence. We are living in an era of fascism that relies on the subjugation of women. To end violence on our communities, we must end violence against women. Now is the time that when we talk about sexual harassment of rich, famous actresses in Hollywood, we also talk about the marginalized voices, including Native Americans who've experienced sexual assault at more than double 
more than double than any other population. We must talk about the sexual assault and murder of our homeless trans sisters, not just by the everyday person, but by killer cops who are hired to protect us when in fact they inflict the violence on our people, particularly our black community. Now is the time that we not only talk about assault of white collar professionals, but that we center the experience of undocumented women, Filipina domestic workers who are raped by their captive employers, of immigrant women from Mexico who get sexually assaulted several times in route as they cross the border. That we talk about the experience of our Middle Eastern sisters, also known as Southwest Asia, North Africa sisters, who face Islamophobia on top of the sexual assault. It's time that we talk about the trafficked, prostituted Asian women in massage parlors who are sexually exploited and must be decriminalized while stopping the legislation and legalization of a system predicated on the sale of rape. Right. Now is the time that we talk about accountability and what that is and what that looked like and while simultaneously demanding accountability of individuals who perpetuate the hate and the violence such as resignation, such as apologies, we must also demand that these systems that breed violence and, and patriarchy also be dismantled, including ICE, including the prisons, including Trump, who is in office. Sisters, today I challenge you to practice a feminism that is revolutionary. Let us go beyond building a sisterhood rooted in suffering and build a sisterhood rooted in societal transformation. Let us continue to share our stories to demand justice and accountability, but let us also actively work on dismantling the structures and the culture of rape that breeds this violence so that future generations will not only not know rape, will not only not know sexual assault, but they will never know the concept of violence against our people. Most importantly, let us bold, be bold in our dreaming of liberation and reimagine what justice could look like, taste like, feel like. Perhaps it isn't just demanding individual accountability in Hollywood. Perhaps it is ensuring marginalized women of color hold positions in every power level in the film and industry. Perhaps it isn't just demanding resignation of those who assault in academia, but it is demanding that the type of material taught in schools and universities also include exercises to unlearn patriarchy. Perhaps it isn't just electing more marginalized women and peoples into office, it is changing how those offices function, giving more power to the people. Sisters, we are a target for one reason and one reason alone. Because they fear our collective power and growing movement. We are still here and we are not going anywhere. And what we in Affirm say, a woman's place is not in the home. It's not in the kitchen. It's not in the bedroom. A woman's place is here in the streets at the helm of the struggle for liberation of all people. <laughs> Now I want you to chant with me so that all of the Hollywood and all the tourists can hear us. When women and children are under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back. When women and children are under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back. What do we do? Stand up, fight back. What do we do? Stand up, fight back. Thank you. Next up, we have Jasmine Kanick. She's a nationally known writer and media commentator on political, race, and social issues. As a change agent, she was selected as one of Essen Magazine 25 Women Shaping the World and one of the most influential African Americans in Los Angeles under 40. A well-known communication strategist, she worked in Congress, California State Assembly, and at the local level advocating for underrepresented and marginalized communities. Through her journalism, Ms. Kanick has been the driving force behind calling attention to the story of the death of Jamil Moore, a Democratic donor at Buck's home, and the, number, and the numerous allegations made against Buck by young black gay men. So let's hear it out for 
Jasmine Kenick. Okay, everybody, let me try this out. Sisters, how y'all feel? Brothers, y'all all right? All right, that's what I'm talking about. When we talk about the sexual harassment of women in America, let me tell you that it's a short leap from bitch and hoe to me too. I'm gonna repeat that for you. It is a very short leap from the words bitch and hoe to you standing out here saying me too. While it's no secret that the film industry has an undeniable problem with complicity when it comes to the sexual harassment and abuse of women less talked about, is the music industry's complicity and role in adding to the stories of Me Too. Look, I love hip hop. I wanna make that very clear. This is not an assault on hip hop because I grew up on hip hop. I love hip hop. But as a self-respecting, black conscious woman in America, there's very little of what is being peddled today that they call hip hop that I can listen to guilt free. I'm gonna break some down for you. Right now, almost all of the songs on Billboard's, Billboard's Hot Rap Songs chart, including Rockstar by Post Malone, Little Pump's Gucci Gang, Yo Gotti and Nicki Minaj's Rake It yeah Up, Migos Motorsport, and even Cardi B's popular Bodak Yellow, all refer to women as bitches and hoes. All of them, almost all of the songs. Billboard compiles these charts by com combining airplay from all of the radio stations, digital downloads, streaming data, and YouTube views of these songs online. And let me tell you, men are not the only ones buying and listening to rap music in America. And I need that to set in for you. Men are not the only ones listening and supporting and championing this music. And I'm gonna pull over the car for one second on this journey and say R. Kelly's name what? and say it very, very loud because R. Kelly would not be where R. Kelly is right now if it were not for the support of black women. I can't stand up here and rally for women's empowerment and the rights of women to live lives free of sexual harassment and abuse and jump in my car and turn on songs with lyrics that assault my very being. I'm gonna try that one more time. I said I can't stand up here and rally for women's empowerment and the right of women to live lives free of sexual harassment and abuse and jump in my car and turn on songs that assault me and my very being. And just like you can't raise a healthy child in a home smoking cigarettes around them every day. Parents, you can't raise young sons into men who respect women and young girls into self-respecting women when they're watching you shake your ass and get your groove on the songs with the lyrics that tell them just the opposite. As parents, we have a responsibility. We complain about what grown men do. Think about what they saw when they were children. What led them to that? One of my favorite singers, Jill Scott, says in her song petition that you say that I'm wrong for stating my opinion. You say that I'm wrong and there'll be quiet consequences too. But I know my rights, babe. There'll be no law bridging the freedom of my speech or the right for me to petition for remedy of grievances. In 2017, it cannot be socially acceptable to complain about racism freely and point out sexual misconduct in the film industry, but not to criticize a rapper's sexism simply because it's art. In the words of Lauryn Hill, baby girl respect is just a minimum. Sadly, today, hip hop is an art form that is making billions of dollars off of degrading, humiliating, abusing, harassing, and championing sexual violence against women. And that's a fact. Yeah, black women in particular. We have to stop admiring and supporting these artists and then pleading ignorance to what they're saying. We have to stop admiring and supporting these artists and then pleading ignorance to what they're saying. 
sing. I need my water. Sorry. Because this part's really important. And I just, I gotta. Because those are the very songs that make up the soundtrack to you not being able to walk to the park without getting cat called by some man driving by, or you being called a bitch because you don't respond to some man's, hey baby, what's your name? Or some stranger pulling up to me in public with impunity and freely commenting on my ass or some other part of my body. And if any of what I just said has happened to you before, then you need to say me too. Me too. I'm also gonna close out, into, in, close out in the words of another artist who I deeply respect and love. She says, and some of y'all will recognize this, now don't be offended, this is all my opinion, ain't nothing that I'm saying la. This is a true confession of a life learned lesson I was sent here to share with y'all today. My name is Jasmine Canick, and I stand on the shoulders of many great black women who came before me, including my two grandmothers. It's been an honor to be here with you today, and I just want you to remember every time you listen and you to music that calls women bitches, that calls women hoes, that talks about all of these different degrading sex acts, you are also being complicit and supporting the degrading, abusing, harassment, all of it. You're supporting that as well. We need to be more conscious about our music choices and we cannot just look at the film industry. It's been a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you. And that goes as well for all my Spanish people listening to reggaeton. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Next up, we got Madeline Merritt. She's an actress and activist who has long fought for equal rights for women in Hollywood and outside of it. She is a survivor. Madeline reminds us today of the connection between misogyny and illegal gender discrimination in Hollywood and the rape culture that hashtag yes all women continue to combat throughout their lives. Madeline. Hello everybody. It is truly an honor to stand here today with all of these inspiring survivors and say, me too. Too long have we suffered in silence, assuming that our stories of assault were not to be shared, that our stories would only bring shame and damage our identity. But now that a sexual predator sits in the highest office of this land, we can no longer be silenced. In fact, we are currently dethroning the most powerful men in Hollywood who have too long assaulted, intimidated, and silenced us rather than hiring us. <laughs> in my own life, after 10 years of trying to make a career telling stories because I believe in the power of stories to change the world, after 10 years of facing continued discrimination, sexual intimidation, looks-based casting, and shut doors, I am no longer afraid, and I seek to empower all people in our community to stand up and make the world a place that our children and our grandchildren deserve to grow up in. Because feminine power empowers, and we are here to take our rightful place. So today I'm here to share with you the story and words of Maria Geese, who couldn't be here. She is an unsung hero in Hollywood who is known as the troublemaker because she spent the last six years fighting for employment justice within the Directors Guild of America. After four years of activism, after being blacklisted with committees within the DGA, Geese became the person who instigated the biggest industry-wide federal investigation for women directors in Hollywood history, currently underway with the ACLU and Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. This is happening right now as we speak. But back in 1995, she was among the most promising young directors to graduate from UCLA's graduate film program. 
with multiple awards and a job to direct her first feature. When her film, When Saturday Comes, screened at Cannes, she signed with the William Morris Agency and she was attached to several feature films and was in preparation to direct episodic TV. It was 1995. She was ready to launch, but who could have guessed that 1995 would mark the year the number of female director hires would hit its all-time peak? For the rest of her career, that number would decline and sink into stasis. She would never work again as a paid female director. She would never work again as a director. She'd never uh, uh, direct an episode of episodic TV. She would be dropped by her agency. She would watch as her male peers became the cinematic voices of our time. She watched as men who hadn't directed features and had half her training become wealthy and sought after TV directors. Men who would go on to assault and intimidate. Men who would perpetuate rape culture while shutting us out from telling our stories. She became a lost generation of female voices in America's cinema and television. Marginalized as a group, these many she's blamed themselves for their individual failures. Just as many of us here blame ourselves for our individual experiences of discrimination and sexual assault. The virtual absence of women directors in Hollywood is tantamount to the censoring and silencing of female voices in US media, America's most influential global export, and they are silencing us in Hollywood. So way back in 1964, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act established the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, outlawed employment discrimination based on sex. Women do not have to fight that battle again because our state and federal agencies have an illegal ob obligation to enforce that law. And Hollywood, perhaps the most egregious violator of Title VII in any industry in our nation, has an obligation to obey it. Because of Maria's activism, the Equal Opportunity Employment Opportunity Council is in settlement talks with all six major studios right now. But she wants to share this message with you all today. We can't accept anything less than 50-50 equality for women on the screen and behind the scenes. We need the EEOC studio settlement talks to end up in the Supreme Court. We need this whole conversation to move from Hollywood and into Washington, D.C. It is time for a federal mandate for 50-50 gender hiring on the screen and behind the scenes. 50-50 by 2020, 50-50 by 2020, 50-50 by 2020, 50-50 by 2020. Because, yes, all women have to face discrimination, have to fear sexual assault, have experienced harassment, and all of this is perpetuated by a media that doesn't represent us. We are here to take back our voices, to end the stigma, and to demand equality. For women's power empowers. And we are here to take our power and change the world for the better. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today, for marching in the streets, for standing up for what's right, for what you believe in, for standing up for all of our bodies, for Mother Earth, for the Earth within us. That's why we're here. I'm having my sisters stand on stage with me to sing, a, um, and I'm going to sing a song, and then we're going to sing a song together. And I am lending my voice, dedicating my voice today to those women who are missing and murdered, especially missing and murdered indigenous women who can't be here today to speak up, who can't even see their justice served, those who are no longer with us, who suffered such violent crimes and, and sexual assault. Native American people have a higher rate of sexual assault than any other race in the United States. This song is about sisterhood. It's about standing up for what we believe in and marching in the streets, because these are our streets. And no one can tell us to leave and to stop standing up for what we believe in. This song is called Fight For You. Save the river, save the 
overseas Save the mother and the family How can you take what you want and say we are free? If you put oil in the water, we won't sit quietly And we were singing stand up for you Say to the oceans and the streams Say the people who are in need How can you do what you want and say you come in peace If you don't open your eyes How can you see We were cheering, stand up, stand up for what's right Don't walk, don't walk silently into the night Take my hand and we'll say this through If you fight for me, I'll fight for you And don't look down when we march downtown for some truth Stay in the streets, keep fighting, never give up. Your voice is powerful, your voice means something. Your voice is beautiful. My name is Ray Zaragoza, thank you for singing with me. Jada Raspberry is the organizer, organizing director for Dignity and Power Now, DPN. It's a grassroots organization based in LA that fights for the dignity and power of incarcerated people, their families, and communities. In 2006, she was sentenced to Valley State Prison for Women, where she would spend six years of her life. She now educates community members by making them aware of what is happening behind jail walls. As a formerly incar incarcerated person and a queer woman of color, she believes that it's important to be a voice of change in directly impacted communities. Here is Jada Raspberry. Hey, y'all. So my name is Jada Raspberry. I'm organizing director at Dignity and Power Now and organizing lead for Justice LA. Today I'm here representing all incarcerated women who have been sexually assaulted and raped and can't write Me Too as a status. Yes. Being sexually assaulted while incarcerated with no one to turn to is devastating. I did six years in Valley State Prison for Women and I remember several incidents where I was repeatedly sexually harassed and groped while I worked in the kitchen. I was even told to show my vagina to two male staff in order to elude a write-up because I was late three times to work. When things started to get out of hand, I was, I was placed under investigation and during an interview with the ISU sergeant, I was asked detailed questions about what happened to me in front of the people who abused me. In jail and prison, women are expected to report to the people they're reporting on in hopes that the people they want investigated will investigate themselves. And I'm gonna re repeat that for y'all. In jail and prison, women are expected to report to the people they're reporting on in hopes that the people they want investigated will investigate themselves. That is a problem. 
That is a problem because that means nobody is being held accountable for abusing us. That means the system is saying that state-sanctioned violence is okay and that we don't matter and that's not true. About two weeks ago, a deputy at Linwood Women's Jail, get this y'all, a deputy at Linwood Women's Jail was accused of raping, was accused of raping, oh my God, <laughs> I just get so emotional when I talk about this. Two weeks ago, a deputy at Linwood Women's Jail was accused of raping another woman after two prior complaints of rape were filed against him. This is becoming a dangerous epidemic and I'm here today to say no more. No more. I'm here today to say I will not be silent any longer. That is why we need subpoena power on the Sheriff's Civilian Oversight Commission so that women can have a safe place to go to. Thank you. Yes. Next up, we have Alicia Barlow. She was molested by her maternal grandfather when she was a child. At the age of six, she told her mom and her two aunts that their dad was touching her inappropriately. They made her promise not to tell anyone, especially the police and her own father. They told Alicia not to worry and that they would make sure her grandfather would stop. We've heard that before. They promised that they would send him to jail if it continued. Alicia did not tell anyone and the molestation continued. 20 years later, Alicia created Tell Somebody Inc., an organization that works towards ending child abuse of any kind. Her new book, Tell Somebody, Volume 1, The Basics for Children, and her memoir, End Silence Abuse, is out now. Let's welcome Alicia Barlow, one of many children that get abused. Tell somebody. Yes, yes. So, you see Harvey Weinstein, you see Corey Feldman, and you see me too. But what you see is that it's time to tell somebody. And if you don't see that, it's time to open your eyes. And this is the change right here. I am a survivor of child abuse. I was molested by my grandfather and at age six, I told my mother and her two sisters that their dad was touching me. They told me to keep it a secret from the police and my own dad, but still brought me around him and the abuse continued. It took me 20 years to tell my dad, but the moment I told him, I felt a weight lifted off my shoulder. I felt a freedom for the first time in 30 years. And that's why I'm here, is to give strength to other survivors. I saw a post in the Me Too chat room and it said, I am 64 years old and I still feel worthless. And I saw hundreds of women underneath say I am 32, I'm 29, I'm 46, and I still feel worthless. And I want you guys to look at me and tell me, do you think I feel worthless? No, no I don't. And that is because I'm helping people. I have my Ch Tell Somebody Children's book. Me and my eight-year-old daughter go to different schools and we educate children about their body. We let them know that they need to tell somebody if they are being touched inappropriately. And I also have my memoir, In Silence Abuse, Tell Somebody, that just came out. I also have a table over there where I'm selling my books. And Oprah wrote the quote on the front for me. She said that I am the perfect role model for turning pain into power. So I just wanted to say that you have to tell somebody that is how you heal, by helping and taking your power back. So I just want you guys to repeat after me. Tell somebody, tell somebody. it happened to me too. Thank you. Oh wait, my website, www.istimetotellsomebody.org. Thank you. Samuel Lloyd, best friend of Jamil Moore, 26, a black gay man who was found dead on July 27th in prominent Democratic donor Ed Buck's West Hollywood apartment under suspicious circumstances. Several other young gay black men have come forward as victims of Ed Buck, who's white. Samuel has dedicated himself to finding hashtag justice for Jamil. Here is Samuel.
Hi, I'm Samuel. Um, I prepared something, but I don't know if I'm gonna read for me. I'm the best friend of Jamel Moore, who was murdered by Ed Buck. He's a political prominent donor. Um, <laughs> I'm a little nervous. <laughs> this man, he preyed on young gay black men in our community to get them addicted to drugs. He shot my best friend up with methamphetamine numerous times and stood over him and watched him die. He then cleared the bed of the sheets and cleared the house of all the drugs and the paraphernalia and then called the police. He didn't, he didn't render aid to my best friend. You know, there's many other people that have come forward that say this man has shot them up in their sleep. You know, and he's preying on people in our community that that are homeless and that are struggling, and and he's getting them addicted to drugs, and that takes away their credibility in a lot of people's eyes because they're they're drug addicts. You know, th this man, he he's still out here. I just I just spoke with somebody who who had seen him at the Gold Coast preying on other other men. You know, sat outside the Gulf Coast flashing his lights at a black man to get his attention. You know, my nephew was a great guy. He was, he was, he was always there for me. You know, this is going to be the first birthday I get to spend without him. You know, and that was stolen from me. You know, this man was, he took that from me. And he took that from this, from Jamel's mom, you know. If you guys want to check out the movement, it's hashtag justice for Jamel. He's, he's gone, you know? I don't get to look him in his eyes and you know why he sings me happy birthday, you know? This man, he, he has victimized so many men in our community and nothing has been done. You know, they, they initially the, the sheriff's department made it an open and closed case. They said, you know, young prostitute you know was was found dead in somebody's apartment you know that's all that they said and they opened and closed the case this is not this this was not a young prostitute who was found in somebody's house this was a a loved and 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 cherished young man whose life was stolen you know his name is ed buck please please hashtag justice for jamel because we love him and we don't want it we, we don't want his his story to be ended just like that you know gone thank you as a child of muslim immigrants migrants sorry hussein has long advocated for the civil rights of muslims in the west and for the liberation of muslims abroad living under ice israeli a authority a new u.s american military occupation here is hussein turk I'd like to begin by remembering the indigenous Gabrielino women and two-spirit people who were sexually assaulted, raped, and murdered by the white Europeans who forcibly occupied, colonized, and settled this stolen land upon which we are gathered today. My name is Hussein Turk and I am a survivor of child pornography, sexual battery, rape, and I am not alone. The epidemic of sexual harassment, assault, and violence that we are gathered here today to expose and denounce is an epidemic that has its roots in white supremacy. The kidnapping and raping of indigenous Americans was a terrorist tactic central to the occupation and colonization of this continent by white European men and women. And as forgetful as we are about slavery in this country, what we remember even less is the routine sexual terrorism that plagued the daily lives of African women held in captivity and bondage by white US heroes like Thomas Jefferson and, and Andrew Jackson. Slavery then mutated into a postbellum era branded by the broken promises of emancipation. 
During this time, white women and men conjured the mythical black male rapist, and they systematically fabricated allegations of sexual assault to justify the widespread lynching of black men and boys as young as 14 years old. And given that sexual violence was so essential to the very foundational acts upon which this nation state was created, we should not be surprised today that sexual violence is as pervasive as it is. The difference today is that for once, the problem is no longer in the shadows. The mainstream media is paying attention and serial predators are being held to account. And for that, we owe ourselves, and especially the brilliant black and brown women leading this movement, a collective and congratulatory moment of loving affirmation and applause. But, there's always a but, as we continue to expose truth and hold to account the white men who have raped and sexually assaulted us, we must also truthfully ask ourselves, why now? Why is the world paying attention right now? And to whom are we paying attention? Why do we seem to finally, but only care about sexual violence when white celebrity victims step forward? Where was this movement on June 18, 2017, when Nabra Hassanan, a 17-year-old Muslim girl, was raped and murdered in Virginia? Where was this movement when U.S. soldiers photographed themselves sexually assaulting and battering Muslim prisoners at Abu Ghraib? Where was this movement when Clarence Thomas was confirmed to the bench of the Supreme Court despite Anita Hill's sworn and proven testimony? And where was this movement on July 27th when Jamel Moore was murdered in West Hollywood? Jamel was killed by Ed Buck. Buck is a wealthy, white, gay man who has donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to the Democratic Party. Among his donees is West Hollywood City Council person John Duran, who accepted $24,700 from Ed Buck. John Duran recently warned potential witnesses from testifying against Buck, who has a known and documented history of sexual predation and assault against young black boys like Jamel. Unlike you and I, Jamel is not a survivor of sexual violence because like Nabra Hassanan and hundreds of thousands of indigenous people and African bond women, Jamel died at the hands and because of his sexual predator. And unlike the white women and men survivors of Weinstein's and Spacey's sexual predation, almost no public attention has been given to Jamel's death, and that is something that we are all responsible for. <laughs> sexual assault is about the exploitation of power. If we are not centering the experiences of those survivors and victims who are most disempowered by racism and sexism and capitalism and imperialism, then we are part of the problem. So I urge you to demand justice for Jamel. I urge you to demand that Sheriff, Sheriff Aloma of the West Hollywood Sheriff's Department arrest Ed Buck for killing Jamel and for continuing to sexually harass, assault, and prey upon other young gay men on the streets of West Hollywood. I urge you to demand that our local and state elected leaders, including John Duran, John D'Amico, Eric Garcetti, and Jerry Brown, return the blood money donated to them by Ed Buck. I urge you to look back through history and explore the margins of today's society for the black and brown trans survivors of sexual violence who have been speaking truth to power and who the media continues to ignore because black lives matter, especially in the fight against sexual violence. <laughs>